I now request our, our head of department, Professor Mohan and Pillai, to please give the welcome address. Revered Vice Chancellor, Professor Gumar Mit Singh, Ambassador T P Srinivasan, Vice Admiral M P Murli Dharan, Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan, Ambassador Sajinhar, my brother from Poland, Jakub, and. Uh, my colleagues, friends and students, uh, this is uh, part of this seminar is part of our uh, UGC Special Assistance Program, DRS2. So we have come to the second level of uh, uh, Special Assistance Program. And uh, the, the thrust area of uh, our Special Assistance Program is security and strategic studies. That's the reason that we have invited uh, retired Army Naval officers and also ambassadors to this program because from, we want to learn from their practical knowledge. I don't want to go into the theme part of the seminar now because immediately after the inaugural is over, we are going to have our panel discussion. There, uh, the theme of uh, the pan, uh, seminar will be discussed. and. Uh, about, uh, I just want to tell something about uh, the Department of Politics and International Studies, which actually started as a school of international studies uh, immediately after the uh, inauguration of this university. One of, the, one of the initial schools of the university, School of International Studies. That was modeled after actually the uh, School of International Studies of the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, the first director, public dean of that school was Ambassador N. Krishnan. And in that way it started. And uh, it functioned as a school till 2004. Then uh, then Vice Chancellor felt that uh, uh, it is desirable to merge that with the School of Social Sciences. And it was then merged with the School of Social Sciences and the larger School of Social Sciences and International Studies has been created. Uh, and uh, in that way, I would say that uh, we are uh, slightly losers because our programs in that way got uh, into a, a common kind of framework that uh, actually uh, it has really affected the growth of the School of International Studies here. And uh, when I was uh, the head of the department in 2009 also, I made all the efforts to revive it. And because it's not to stop, it is there. It is one of the first of the statute schools in the and their university. It, uh, it, uh, it, has, it has been merged. So I have then why to Professor Tharian when he was Vice Chancellor, I tried with him to revive and uh, make, uh, bring back uh, the School of International Studies with the uh, number of centers that we have. Uh, I, I, I it didn't materials, uh, materialize at that point of time. Now we have a very friendly Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmeet Singh. And he is very, very, very uh, uh, active and also uh, very uh, much encouraging the academic activities here. And uh, in this open platform, sir, I have a small request to you that, if possible, revive and give us back our School of International Studies. <laughs> so with this, uh, uh, I must say that, see, our total strength in the school is, uh, uh, we have 24 resource scholars, then uh, MA, we are running three MA programs, one is five-year integrated MA political science, and two-year MA program in political science, and two-year MA in, in politics and international relations. Put together, our strength is uh, 300 plus. I think uh, I have, uh, in a way, in, in instructed that all our students must come here. Last time, uh, you raised the question whether the, you said 300, where is the 300? Now I think all of them have come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sir, we are the largest and the biggest in the, the, the combined School of Social Sciences and International Studies. And uh, because of that, uh, if, if we get back our school, I think we can grow further with our activities. And uh, that is the only request that I would like to present before the Vice Chancellor, revered Vice Chancellor in this, you know, August kind of a gathering, in front of this kind of a gathering. With this initial remark, I say to go to my, uh, uh, my duty. And uh, of course, uh, 
Professor Gurmeet Singh is very much part of uh, the organizing committee and all, and he is actually the chairperson of the SAP program. But even then, I think uh, I have to start by welcoming, sir, uh, our chair, uh, vice chancellor uh, from the uh, 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 part of this Department of Politics and International Studies. I extend you, sir, a hearty welcome to this program. <laughs> then Ambassador Srinivasan, he is a very active uh, academician now, I must say. He is a prolific writer. He writes uh, in almost all the newspapers in India and uh, he is uh, running the own International Studies Center and very active academically in that way and uh, very uh, in his busy schedule he has agreed kindly uh, I mean I requested him and he accepted and he has come sir I am so much grateful to you and I uh, welcome to this uh, program <laughs> Vice Admiral Murali then uh, actually, uh, recently I was in Trivandrum in another program. I saw him there and I listened to his uh, presentation there. Then I thought that uh, he is the right person to inaugurate a program that is connected with the strategic culture and all of uh, uh, I mean our program. So I then, I then contacted him and he readily agreed on behalf of the Department of Politics and International Studies and on my own personal behalf. Uh, Vice Admiral, I extend you a hearty welcome. <laughs> then Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan is actually UGC's nominee to our SAP program. For this special assistance program, there will always be two nominees. One is Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan, the other person could not make uh, to come because he is out of the country now. Uh, sir, on behalf of the department and on my own personal behalf, I extend you a Welcome to this then Professor Rekotam, Venkata Rekotam, he is our uh, friend, uh, colleague and uh, 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 always uh, he is with us, he encourages us, he is a, a very uh, jovial kind of a person, academically oriented and uh, 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 I'm, I'm happy that, uh, in fact he came slightly early and he has been waiting all these, you know, not two hours, he has waited here thinking that uh, we would start by two. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it, I feel slightly sorry about, uh, you know, making you to wait here like that. And on behalf of the department and also on my personal behalf, I request you. <laughs> then uh, Professor Murthy is my colleague in the department. It's, uh, it's not good to welcome him because he is part of the organizing committee and all. But even then, to suit to the occasion, I extend a hearty welcome to you also. Okay. And, uh, we have some 55 presentations in three, three parallel sessions, put together 55 presentations from all over the country. We have research, I mean, uh, delegates have come, young, young scholars, a uh, number of young scholars have come. And uh, in that way, I am very happy and I extend a hearty welcome to all of you. <laughs> then, of course, uh, in the next session, we have the uh, I mean, uh, panel, panels, uh, panel that is there. For that, uh, Ambassador uh, Ashok Sajanahar is there. Sir, I send you a hearty welcome. Then, uh, uh, Professor Yakub is the director of the Institute of International Relations in uh, Warsaw University. Uh, he is a very good friend of mine. And uh, uh, he has come here for another program. And I told him that then you participate in our program also. He accepted. And he is here very much. Uh, a hearty eh, welcome to this program. <laughs> then my colleagues in the department, my dear students, I extend a hearty welcome to all of you. And uh, uh, I think I have the formal welcome part of it I have completed. I think I have, been, I have not uh, missed any one of you. And uh, uh, on an, I, I on, once again uh, welcome all of you to this uh, program. Listen to this. Once this, uh, you know, inaugural is over, uh, we will have a, the panel discussion and after that we have arranged a, a, a cultural program also uh, uh, that also all of uh, us can enjoy and once again I welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next dignitary to address us is Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan. He has served as the ambassador in Vienna and Slovenia and was also the permanent representative of India to the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency. 
He has served in the IRS for more than 37 years and is now the head for the Council of the Higher Education of the State of Kerala and the Executive Vice President with the rank of Vice Chancellor. Sir, I would love, like to request you to please give the address. Distinguished Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmeet Singh, Vice Admiral M.P. Murali Dharan, Professor Rajesh Raj Gopalan, Professor Venkatar Gautam, Professor Murthy, and Professor Mohan and Bhaskaran Pillai, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanar and friends. I also see that 90% of the strategic community in Trivandrum is here. So there are two people other than me from Trivandrum and we comprise of the strategic community about 90% from Kerala. So that's also a happy, happy situation, including Mohan and he's also from Kerala. So, so we have a very strong contingent. So good to, have, good to see you all here. In fact, coming to Pondicherry is always a pleasure. It's one of the most beautiful places in India, at least. And I took a picture out of my window and sent it to all my friends. And they looked at it and said, but you have not gone from Kerala. This scenery looks like Kerala. It doesn't look like Pondicherry. And that is another happy... In fact, I was wondering why Pondicherry University had forgotten us, because last two, three years, I haven't received any invitation. I was not too busy. But, so thank you, Mohan, and to, for inviting me to participate in this. In fact, there is no better occasion than this, than today or these days, to talk about this particular subject of India's strategic culture and policy options. It is almost two weeks since the attack occurred, the terror attack occurred, and we are still looking for a strategic option. Everybody started by saying there are three options. The first is attack back, start a war. And everybody, it sounded very good at that time because everybody was angry. We were angry about Pakistan, we were angry about uh, the terrorist organization. We were angry about our own politicians who, is, who are keeping Kashmir as some kind of a bargaining point. We are angry with ourselves that we have not been able to break this cycle of violence. And therefore, it, looked, appear, it appeared at that time, and the Prime Minister kept reminding us that we shall not forgive and we shall not forget. But that has not happened. So that option, maybe it is there. In fact, the Prime Minister said the other day that we already started giving the answer in Army's own ways. So we do not know. The second option was to Isolate Pakistan. Just turn around and tell the world Pakistan is horrible, so please hate Pakistan and everybody agrees. And that has also not worked. What we claim to be a great victory in the United Nations Security Council is nothing but old hat. In fact, there is nothing in that statement which hurts Pakistan in any manner. In fact, Pakistan can sign that statement because all that you say about, hurt, about terror and all that we say about our decision to combat terror are all sentences which have come from consensus documents of the United Nations in which Pakistan could be a partner. Then we claim that, oh, Jaysh-e Mohammed is mentioned there. And as the Chinese representative clarified, please read that sentence. It says Jaysh-e Mohammed which has claimed responsibility for the attack. Nothing else. So that is not judgmental. And about the right of India to defend itself. It comes from the United Nations Charter. So what have you got from the international community? Except this kind of, what shall I say, a consensus position. So isolation of Pakistan is also not an option. So do we have a, have a third option? The third option is to negotiate with our own people in Kashmir and try to, try to solve the problem ourselves. Particularly since the bomber was not Pakistani, he was an Indian. So this particular incident has shown us that our strategic options are very limited when a crisis occurs. So this, this is a particular moment when we sitting in Pondicherry could Think over this, and probably perhaps the whole session, these things, these options will appear. 
and we'll try to find out whether our strategic option or options or strategic culture will be of any particular help. And that is why I said this is a very appropriate time for us to discuss this. Of course, I was in New York in 1992 when this whole debate was started by the RAND report, which we are all familiar with. As you know, all our discourses, all our thoughts, all our narratives come from the United States. Even BRICS came from the United States. So there was this report by George Tanham saying that uh, India is too preoccupied with Buddha and Mahatma Gandhi and so on. And therefore, India does not have a strategic culture. Then everybody in India was very agitated. We don't have a strategic culture? Hmm, of course, we have a strategic culture. So after that, from 92 to 2006, everybody kept saying India has no strategic culture. We kept saying we have a strategic culture. And in 2006, somebody did another study and uh, congratulated us. No, no, India has a strategic culture. And we are all very happy. What does all this mean? And then finally, Mr. Shiva Shankar Menon, our most eminent uh, diplomat, put the whole thing to rest by saying, I shall quote him here. So this was in 2013. So Shiva Shankar Menon said, frankly speaking, for a civilization and state like India, not to have a strategic culture is impossible. Very obvious, right? And then he went on to say, of course in India, we have a strategic culture. It is one indigenous construct over millennia modified considerably by experience in the last two centuries. So this is a very magisterial statement by Shivashankar Menon, setting at rest the whole debate whether we have a strategic culture or not. And then we have started searching for it. Where is our strategic culture? And what is it that you have steadily in your policy in foreign policy? So, in the last few days that I knew I was coming here, what I did was to simply look at some of the major decisions in foreign policy which have been taken by successive governments of India to see whether there is a strain or a common platform or a common thought or a common principle which has dictated all these important actions of the government of India. Just about four or five, there have been hundreds of such policy decisions. And if you look at them, we have to see by looking at them, what were the circumstances in which those decisions were taken? And what were the considerations when those decisions were taken? What were the principles that we applied? And did we succeed or not? So I would like to very quickly take you through some of these, what shall we say, case studies. And these are not ancient case studies. It does not come from the Arthashastra. It has come from my own time in the foreign, policy, in foreign service, or just before that and just a bit after that. So if you're looking at about, say, 50 years, or maximum 70 years, and look at some of these very crucial decisions that we took in India's foreign policy, and whether this reveals any kind of a strategy. So first, the most important decision that Indian foreign policy makers took was to adopt non-alignment as a policy. Of course, Pandit Nehru invented it. He, took, he found the wrong word for it because non-aligned does not convey what non-aligned really is. Because if non-aligned is a positive concept, the word non should not fit there. So we have now finally found a positive word, which is strategic autonomy, which is not different from non-alignment. So why did we adopt this policy? Was it because of our strategic culture? Or was it because of the need of the R? Even if it was Pandit, not Pandit Nehru was the Prime Minister, even if somebody else with less imagination, even with less knowledge of the country, would have decided upon whatever could be called a non-aligned policy. Because after 20 years of British rule, we were not going to go back and embrace Western culture or Western bloc. And the communists, there was no attraction for us for the communists. There was no particular liking for communism in India at that time. And Soviet Union was a model in Pandit Nehru's mind in terms of 
um, infrastructure building and uh, creating military power out of a modest income. And these were kind of models that he had. But beyond that, there was no particular attraction for the Soviet model. And therefore, the obvious decision which was taken was that we would follow a non-aligned policy. And that turned out to be, they considered, the Americans considered it immoral, and they turned us around and said that since you are not, not with us, you are against us. And the Soviet Union embraced us saying that, oh, we are brothers, we are natural allies, because you and we are saying the same thing. And therefore, we suddenly found ourselves in the embrace of the Soviet Union. And then many people started calling us a satellite of the Soviet Union or a Sputnik of the Soviet Union, very appropriate. Which is not true, because we are not attracted by any kind of ideology when we decided to be non-aligned. And we did business with the Soviet Union basically because it suited us economically. Our status of our um, consumer society in India, or the consumer goods in India, were so, was so low that nobody else other than the Soviet Union would have purchased our Panama cigarettes and Ludhiana sweaters. No other country, no other Western, no Western country would have purchased them. So we had this great advantage when we had a shortage of foreign exchange. You had a possibility of a rupee-ruble agreement. And by giving these low-quality consumer goods, we got back Bokaro and Bilai and HAL, Bangalore and many other things, which gave us a very stable infrastructure foundation. So this, is, this was non-alignment, I know, because there are so many other aspects to it. So we have to see where this came from, this decision to be non-aligned. Then, uh, if, you, if you look further and uh, up, look at uh, India's, the position taken by India, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, at the United Nations. So what were the concerns that India expressed? As India's dreams, but also we considered them the world's dreams. In fact, if you recall the <coughs> speech that Pandit Nehru made, his first speech on foreign policy, he said, these are our dreams, but these are also the dreams of the world. He claimed that our dreams were the dreams of the world. And what did he do? He presented certain ideas at the United Nations, which would appeal to not only uh, other the, uh, the countries who were already there in the United Nations, but also those which had not become independent. So those countries which are emerging, they were attracted by these concepts. What are these? First is decolonization. Second is disarmament. Third is equitable distribution of wealth. Fourth is human rights. So it appealed to them when they heard this that here is a man who is representing all of us. So, Prime Minister Nehru became the leader of the, the so-called third world at that time. And India's, perhaps the golden time India's foreign policy from 1947 to 1962. Of course, you know what happened in 62. So, the advantage or the, or the tactics that he used was to say to the world, whatever was India's concerns, as the concerns of humanity. Why did we support decolonization? Because we were interested in a constituency. If you did not support decolonization, and if decolonization did not take place, and India had a fantastic credentials for that, because we won our independence without firing a bullet, without shedding blood. And it was a model which appealed to the countries which were aspiring for freedom, and so our words on decolonization were very convincing. On disarmament, why he did that? Because he had not built an army to fight against the Chinese. So it was difficult. His job options was either to build an army which will match the powerful countries of the world, or make sure that those countries abandon arms and ammunition so that uh, they come down to our level. Either we rise to their levels or bring them down to our levels. That was his very selfish approach to disarmament. And wealth distribution. Fair enough, because 
if, had it not, if it was not for a kind of understanding that the wealthy countries owe something to the poorer countries, then there would, would have been no understanding on what the world should be. And human rights, of course, it was very difficult for us to talk about human rights because those days, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc were targeted with human rights accusations. So in spite of that, he adopted that also. So these ideas that we put forward at the United Nations were actually India's interests, which he disguised as global interests, and therefore he was able to command a kind of leadership in the, in the third world. So what was the consideration there? Is there something between our non-aligned policy and is there something connected with it in our non-UN agenda? Was there a link between the two? And then, of course, if we, if we move on, one decision that is being considered a blunder of Prime Minister Nehru, because they all started with seven blunders of Nehru, then 70 blunders of Nehru. Now there is a book called 700 blunders of Nehru, so I stopped reading them. <laughs> so, so the first blunder of Nehru was to have taken Kashmir to the UN. Everybody is convinced that it was not a wise decision. Then what is it that prompted him to take it to the UN? Was he foolish enough to think that what we could not do on the border here in two days, he could do it in one day in the United Nations? Did he think that the United Nations was a, such a fair body, like the Supreme Court of India, will make a judgment and take a decision and solve the problem? Did he not know that the United Nations is actually not a democratic body? So why did he take to the United Nations? Was it a blunder or was it a conscious decision? It was a conscious decision because he did not want to be an invader. It was not India's image. So instead of sending the Indian army to Kashmir and throwing the Pakistanis out of the occupied Kashmir, he went several miles away to New York to present that case. Because he realized that this is not something which will be resolved in a day or two. Maybe he did not anticipate this will become a stone around our neck for the rest of our lives. But at least he felt that he, he could get breathing time. He, could, he need not get the name of an aggressor. He need not be told that he is somebody who did not love peace. So the best option for him at that time was simply to take the issue to the United Nations and leave it there. Of course, it became much more complicated than it happened to be. Then the end of our golden, golden years is the Chinese aggression of 1962. This is certainly exposed India's weaknesses to the world. This is not what the world had thought. The world had thought that India was stronger, India was more determined, or at least uh, less cowardly than what we were, because we did not fight the Chinese. We ran away from the war front. When the Chinese were coming down the hills, people were running away from Tezpur. So it was a terrible shame uh, that this happened. And um, had it not been for the fact that the Chinese had withdrawn by themselves, we would have been speaking American today. Because the Americans were the only country which helped us at that time or tried to help us. Tons and tons of ammunition and arms were dumped into New Delhi, asking us to fight the Chinese. And nobody else, the Soviet Union said one is a brother and the other is a friend, etc. We never remember it. We don't remember anything that the Americans have done. And therefore, we have forgotten that. But had it not been for the fact that the Chinese had withdrawn unconditionally, we would have been probably the 51st state of the United States by now. And that was providential that they decided so. We don't know why they did that. And again, how did we react to that? Of course, Pandit Nehru was too weak to react to it because he was so shaken by what happened. But it opened our eyes to the fact that you need to have a strategic culture. We had never thought of China as an enemy. In fact, his vision was that China and India would join together I will take the leadership of Asia first, and then take the leadership of Afro-Asia, 
and then we'll counter the West. So that dream collapsed at that time. And then we were struggling ahead in order to establish ourselves. We realized the need for us to strengthen our defense capability. We realized that we ought to have strong friends in the world. We realized that we need to have a constituency like the non-aligned bloc in order to give us some support in these terrible times. And that is how we survived the 1962 uh, crisis. Then, moving further on, very quickly to the end of the Cold War. Because before that, there is one other point that we have to remember is the 1974 test, Mrs. Gandhi's nuclear test, what she called the peaceful explosion. And have you ever heard of peaceful explosions? <laughs> the point was that it was an explosion meant for peaceful purposes. And she said things like, we are doing this because if we want to build a dam or divert a river, nuclear energy is very useful. Have you ever heard anybody doing that, using a bomb in order to divert a river? She, of course, knew that this was not the truth. But she said that this peaceful nuclear explosion. And we told everybody, we do not have a nuclear weapon. Well, everyone else told us that you have a nuclear weapon. In fact, I had this unique experience when I was in the UN in 74, late after 74, about 79. Everybody told us you have a nuclear weapon, you are a nuclear weapon state. And in 98, 1998, we declared that we are a nuclear weapon state. Everybody said you are not a nuclear weapon state. <laughs> that was a very happy, happy situation. So why did she do that in 1974? And why did, she not, why did India do that in 1964? What was the logic? or waiting for 10 years to do this, when you knew that the Chinese had uh, already acquired nuclear weapons. And before that, of course, we decided not to sign the NPT. There again, what was the part was that prompted us to not to take, not to sign the NPT? In fact, we did not know till 1998 that before we decided not to sign the NPT, India had sent special emissaries to USSR and USA asking whether if we signed the NPT, whether we would be given a nuclear umbrella. I don't know how many of you have heard about this. And this got revealed only in 1998. Because when everybody was attacking us about this test, we revealed this secret that we had sent special emissaries to both Soviet Union and the United States asking whether if we signed the NPT, we would get a nuclear umbrella. Because the argument was that India was the only big country without either nuclear weapons or a nuclear umbrella. And both of them, United States and USSR, refused to give any kind of nuclear umbrella to India. And it's only after that Mrs. Gandhi decided that we shall not sign the NPT. And that position has remained, has sustained over the years, and has also the majority support of the people of the world. So what does that decision mean? What exactly was the strategic background which led to that decision? I was in Moscow those days, and even the Soviet Union refused to accept India's nuclear test. And they said that, yes, we are very good friends, but you better keep away from these dirt these expensive toys so that uh, we can be more friendly. So then if you move quickly to the end of the Cold War, if any one of you have seen Mr. Narasimha Rao on the day the Berlin Wall collapsed, you would have realized what India's state of mind was. This man was looked, looked white because all his blood has gone out of his face because India was so comfortable with this Cold War and non-aligned and so on. And uh, so he felt like an orphan when the Soviet Union disappeared. That was the kind of mood there was. And our ambassador in, this may be a secret, our ambassador in Moscow kept telling him, no, 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 this is not over yet. There may be a coup and uh, communism might come back. And whenever he got those telegrams, I could see him smiling that uh, the story is not over. But the remarkable way in which he adjusted to it within days of this, is something, again, we have to think about our strategic, uh, uh, you know, what, whatever strategic thinking, thinking we had. And uh, within days, he sent an ambassador to Israel, 
started getting friendly with the United States and he went to Washington and signed an agreement or at least a joint statement which would ensure according to him that India would never have had to test a nuclear weapon anymore because the president had told him apparently that uh, you don't have to worry because we will not press you to sign the NPT. So after the tests were over when he was really sick and was traveling to United States in Boston, I met him at the airport and I asked him about the nuclear test. He said, that secret will go to my grave. So I couldn't ask him anything further. <laughs> so, so he felt that he had resolved that issue and India would never have had to test. And he tried to test several times, all that story you know very well. So what prompted us or what was the background or what were the principle or what is the strategy that adopted to adjust ourselves very quickly to the United States, accept the unipolar world, and like everybody else in the world, trying to be very close to the United States, and uh, try to resolve all the problems, except of course the issue of uh, nuclear weapons. And in 2000, when Mr. Vajpayee came to Washington, everything looked beautiful, and Clinton had already come to India, and we had this fantastic situation where India and the US had 35 working groups working on various issues except the uh, nuclear issue, which everybody thought that could not be done. But lo and behold, in 2005, we have the beginnings of the nuclear deal, which was signed in 2008, and we agreed to so many things that we would not have even imagined that we would do. That is, allowing inspection of our nuclear, certain nuclear stations, separating the peaceful stations from the so-called military stations, even saying, even agreeing in principle that India's foreign policy will be consistent with the foreign policy of the United States. That is the extent to which we went in order to get the nuclear deal done. And sure enough, soon after that, we passed our nuclear liability law and made sure that the United States will not be able to sell even a pin to India's nuclear establishment. So here we stand. And uh, so the, I just picked up these several uh, instances of important decision making to see whether there is anything in this which gives you a vision or a hint of what is India's strategic culture. Maybe I should leave it to you to decide on this. But let me give you my own, my own assessment of the situation. If you, if you think we have a strategic culture, I would say that we have the ability to be pragmatic, but that pragmatism we are able to disguise as idealism. You please think about it and try to apply this principle to all that I said. What is it that dictated us all through, right from non-aligned movement to the, to the nuclear deal? It was sheer pragmatism. I don't think it had anything to do with Kautilya's Arthashastra. <laughs> you know, when we have a crisis, we don't just run around and say, where is Kautilya's Arthashastra? Let me find out what we do about this. That is not how it was done. May have been there, Arthashastra may have been there, it may have influenced our thinking. Of course, Mahabharata and Ramayana should have influenced our thinking also, because these are all about war and peace. But what is it that dictated us in all these policies? It is pragmatism. And we were clever enough to present that pragmatism or present those policies which were totally pragmatic as idealistic and the interest of the world. So if you ask me what is the difference between Mr. Nehru's foreign policy and Mr. Modi's foreign policy, I would clearly say that we have now become a transactional foreign policy. Mr. Modi being a very good, efficient Gujarati businessman knows how to do business. But Mr. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru had no, he had no institutions, no business just to take care. So the approach that we took till the current foreign policy of India, there were no transactions. We never said that we will do A, B or C if we get D, E and F. But we did it for the sake of the world. We did this for the common good, but 
we served our own purposes by deliberately <coughs> hiding the pragmatism of Indian foreign policy as something which we are pursuing for the good of the world. So when you have a transactional relationship in foreign policy, the problem is that it will be tested very soon. Nobody said Jawaharlal Nehru failed in A, B or C. Everything that happened was because of what we call the due ex machina in Shakespeare. What happens is in the third or the fourth act, somebody appears on the scene without any warning. You had never heard of him. He appears and he changes everything for the hero. Can you think of something that happened recently which changed everything for our hero? Was the advent of President Donald Trump. Nobody believed that he would come. And he came and all our transactional foreign policy went for a six. And that is because you are saying to the world that if I do this, this will happen to you. If you do this, this will happen to us. You win and I win. That is the approach that we are following. If we follow that, then you will find very soon that in certain cases you don't win. So if you follow a policy of pragmatism, which is presented as something good for the world, we keep on saying that we don't want anything from the United Nations. What we want is to present something to the United Nations, serve the world. And that was the policy that we used. And perhaps if you ask me what is our strategic culture or policy option, Yes, pursue a pragmatic foreign policy, judged on the basis of the actual situation, but don't say that you are pursuing an interest of U.S., say that this is for the world and prove it to them that this is good for the world also. And that is where the, the difference is. And that is where we are yet to know in the next three or four months when Mr. Modi leaves the scene, even as he finishes his first term, how he would be judged. He would be judged differently from the way Pandit Nehru or Indira Gandhi or Narasimha Rao was judged because he was looking for specific advantages for India. And I shall not go into that because that is not our topic for today. So in sum, what I was trying to do was to just look at our policy options on various occasions. And the only strand that I see in this you're not Arthashastra, you're not Ramayana, you're not Mahabharata, but a sense of pragmatism which we presented to the world as a reason for the world to adopt it. And that is really what I think, of course we can debate it in our panels, but this is what I was able to find from a few days of my reading of our foreign policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for those pragmatic thoughts. The next, next dignitary to honor us with his presence is Vice Admiral M.P. Murli Dharan, AVSM, BARNM. He was the first commandant of Indian Naval Academy at Erimala and was Director General of Coast Guard prior to his retirement from Naval Service. During his tenure, he authored nearly 500 judgments, including some landmark ones that benefited the ex-servicemen community. He also sat on regional benches of the tribunal in Guwahati, Mumbai and Jaipur. It's my privilege to invite you, sir, for the inaugural address. Uh, Professor Gurmeet Singh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Ambassador Srinivasan, Professor Rajesh Rajgopal, Professor Venkat Ragotram, Professor Murthy, Professor Mohan Baskan Pillai, Ambassador Asok Chajanar, and very eminent young and not so young scholars who are here this afternoon. In fact, uh, there is an old uh, saying that war is too serious a matter to be left to generals, so somebody else should decide. Uh, so I would like to paraphrase it and say, strategy is too serious a matter to be left to scholars alone, so maybe you need a military man to come in and talk about strategy. Towards the end of the 20th century, virtually every analyst all over the world were forecasting nations that would be powerful or emerge as power centers in the 21st century. And if you recall the publications of that time, India figured in almost every such list of predictions. 
We were seen by many that as a nation that would emerge as a stabilizing power in the new world order. We are now nearly 20% down of the 21st century, or we are in end of the second decade. If we are to play any significant role in the international power play in the world that happens, which today happens to be more globalized than ever before, we need to be very clear about our strategic objectives and priorities. Therefore, I'm happy that we have seminars like this conducted, which deliberate on our strategic culture, examine future policy options, and regularly review the same so that we could emerge as a true global power. Now, what I'm going to speak over the next 15, 20 minutes would be a slightly different variant from what my uh, predecessor, Ambassador Srinivasan had spoken. But these are varying thoughts, so I leave it to you to judge where we stand, and probably you will have a third view or a fourth view. We often hear that India does not have any strategic culture. While many within India itself propound such a theory, many others, including a number of foreign analysts, as we heard, see a clear strategic culture in India from ancient times. So what exactly is strategic culture? While there are many definitions, a commonly accepted definition is that it's a set of shared beliefs, assumptions, and behavior derived from common experience and accepted narratives that shape collective identity and relationships to other groups, and that which determines ends and means of achieving security objectives. At this stage, let me come to a poem from the noted poet Mohammed Iqbal, which incidentally was what I'm quoting to you, is also quoted by our Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh in Rajya Sabha in 2012. And it goes, Yunan o Misht o Rome sab mit gaye jahan se ab tak. Magar hai baaki namo nishan hamara. Kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari. Sadiyo raha hai dushman dore zaman hamara. It means that Greeks, Egyptians and Romans have all vanished. But we are still here. There must be something special that we still exist despite the whole world being against us. So one way of looking at this, evidently, we had a strategic culture over the millennia, even though it may not have been in the modern formulation that we today look for, or else we may not have survived even as a civilization. So what exactly is strategy? While I talked about a definition earlier, National strategy could also be looked at as a plan for employment of various tools of national power to achieve national security objectives. Quite often, a formal articulation of national strategy or policy is not available in public domain. That does not necessarily mean that no such policy exists. In fact, articulation by many nations of their national strategy or policy itself is a comparatively recent phenomenon. In our context, Arthashastra by Chanakya or Kautilya was possibly the first known document on statecraft. However, scholars now conclude that there were at least 14 similar documents prior to the one by Kautilya. And this observation is based on the very first sloka of, of Arthashastra, which says that it has been prepared by bringing together teachings and treatises on science of politics, as has been composed by ancient teachers. Even Mahabharata mentions politics and administration, implying that the ancient kings of India had certain sets of principles for guidance. Coming back to Arthashastra, Kautilya brings out that public welfare was contingent upon the king or one of the strengths of the state which in turn could be achieved to 
internal development and territorial expansion. The text further talks of overall economic development, infrastructure, commerce and trade, agriculture, government expenditure and the entire gamut of things that we consider today that a modern state should do for the welfare of its citizens. Kautilya also spoke of economics being regulated through centralized planning, need for effective intelligence, foreign policy and the need to guard against strategies of rival states. It would therefore be evident that we had a clear strategic vision in the ancient times. However, soon after the Mauryan Empire, in my view, we did not have any kingdom that unified the nation as a whole or occupied the bulk of Indian territory that we know today. While the South Indian kingdoms of mainly Cholas and Pallavas did spread the Indian culture and trade far and wide, they did not hold any great sway in northern parts of India, nor did they capture territory worldwide. I'm sure standing on the borders of Tamil Nadu, people will recollect Gangai Kanda Cholan, where they talk of how he went and saw Ganges or captured Ganges. But beyond that, I don't think they held any great sway over large arcs of the Northern Territory. Then, of course, Mughals arrived and held large tracts of land of territory of modern India by the time of Aurangzeb. But subsequently, lost it all to smaller chieftains. And more importantly, in my view, they totally ignored the sea or the maritime aspects of India, where we held sway virtually till about 1300 AD from ancient times. And this enabled the European powers to subjugate the nation. We also lost our strategic thinking or perspective as a nation somewhere along the line. And here I would also like to say that, you know, a lot of people talk about Vasco da Gama discovering India. He actually was lost somewhere in the, while in the African coast, till a Gujarati pilot actually piloted him to India and Indian waters. In the modern context, I would say the development of strategic studies in the form that we know today developed after World War II possibly as a study of security and defense related issues against the backdrop of international politics. I must also add that over a period of time, the traditional concepts of national security, which basically looked at traditional threats from other nation states, has itself undergone a change. Therefore, apart from merely looking after our borders, we need to ensure security of the nation from non-traditional threats such as terrorism and smuggling of narcotics, drugs and explosives, all of which could be termed as transnational crimes. We also need to look at issues such as energy security, environmental security and protection of our trade and commerce, more so considering the globalized nature of trade as it exists today. It's also a fact that quite often rogue nations invoke the term of national security to conceal illegal acts that they surreptitiously support. How then does a nation develop a national strategy or security policies? Broadly speaking, national interests are based on national values and aims. The interest would in turn decide national security objectives from which would flow a security policy of a nation. The security policy would guide formulation of a national strategy and in turn strategy to be, forward, uh, to be followed by its armed forces, that is the land, maritime and air strategies. If you look at the Indian constitution, we could infer that our national aim to be socio-political and economic development of the nation and its citizens. Our national interest would therefore be to ensure sovereignty, unity and territorial integrity of India and preserving its democratic, secular and federal character by providing a secure and stable internal 
an external env environment that's conducive to safety, security and development of the nation and its citizens. Our national sub security objectives would therefore be to ensure security of our territory, citizens, resources and more importantly maritime trade routes. We would also need to ensure a secure internal environment and guard against threats to national unity and development. Our security policy would therefore need to be framed keeping in with such objectives, bearing in mind our economic strength and capabilities while considering the prevailing regional and global security environment. In order to achieve it, it would be essential to strengthen cooperation and friendship with like-minded nations to promote regional and global stability. In the modern era, our strategic perceptives, in my view, would be influenced by our geographical location, our history, culture, and geopolitical and economic realities. We are a continental as well as a maritime nation. Our location at the base of Asia has blessed us with a position in a position to control the entire sea lanes of communication that go through the Indian Ocean and in fact the Asia Pacific as such. Many years ago, our first Prime Minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru had asserted and you could interpret this in any way that you want, India is too big a country to be bound down to any country. India is going to be and is bound to be a big country that counts in world affairs. Therefore, while our size, population, geographic location and now our growing economic strength should have by now made us a significant player with a clear strategic policy, we need to ponder as to if we are there as yet. We have had a National Security Council since 1999, but uh, there is no document in public domain indicating a security, national security strategy or policy. What are the possible reasons, despite the fact that a number of think tanks have been advocating and discussing the issue over the years? I think one major reason is that there is no political consciousness among the political conscious among the political parties as to what our national security issues or national security aspect of security spell, despite the wars that we have fought with our neighbors and the insurgencies and turmoil that has been taking place more in the Northeast and later on Punjab and Kashmir. While Northeast and Punjab are tranquil as of now and would hopefully remain so, as you well aware, Kashmir is very much on the boil. In most cases, armed forces have been left to do the firefighting. While it's a fact that in times of hostilities, the nation comes together, after the event, there is no agreement or long-term plans on how, to, how we should progress further, what actions we should take. Lack of coordination between various governmental agencies on the subject of national security is another concern. However, the Kargil encounter and subsequently the 26-11 attack at Mumbai saw for the first time uh, some coordination happening in security issues. The aspect of maritime security itself got a major fillip after with specific allocation of duties to various sections who would look after what and the coordination has got resolved to an extent as a fallout of 2611. Similarly, as a nation, we also need to decide on the role we want to play globally. We need to agree on whether we should be a global player, a regional player, or a mere bystander who reacts to situations that happen. In this context, I would like to recall an incident that happened some years ago when the then Raksha Mantri or Defence Minister, he proclaimed one particular nation as India's enemy number one. And there was huge hue and cry across 
various other political spectrum to say that why is he calling so and so uh, enemy number one. Similarly, there was also a major political storm when we decided to carry out joint maritime exercises with a group of countries. It was again considered by some as directed against a particular nation and there was big hue and cry. Now, unless we as a nation are able to prioritize what is good for our country, we would not be able to decide on a strategic policy that we should ad adopt or even formulate one. The 21st century in view of the globalization was supposed to be an era of interdependence rather than one of conflicts and rivalry. While there has been coalition forces operating, for example, against the threat of piracy of the coast of Somalia, there have also been sanctions and threats imposed by some nations without any authority of the UN. Looking at our own policy options, as I said, we first need to decide on the role we want to play in world politics. As our Prime Minister declared recently, we are going to be a dollar five trillion economy soon. And my view, therefore, we should have a major say in the state of world affairs. While keeping our national interest to the fore, the challenges facing the world today, more so the unconventional threats that I spoke of, cannot be tackled by one nation alone. Therefore, we need to cooperate with like-minded nations. This can certainly be done on aspects of data and intelligence sharing and joint surveillance and patrolling in some in all the areas of interest. We are doing in some areas, I think we need to do more. Further, to be a global player, we need to be in a position of strength. Only then will our voice carry any value, will we be heard. Apart from economic strength, we also need to have the ability to deploy our armed forces in far-flung areas if needed. Joint exercises with other nations would give us the necessary visibility as well as the capability of developing interoperability. More than any other force, the Navy has the ability to be present wherever there is a sea without impinging on the sovereignty of other states. While having bases overseas will certainly help and enhance the reach of our armed forces, they may not be easy to come by. Therefore, arrangements for logistic support from nations across the globe should be tied up to give us the necessary reach and flexibility. One of our major achievements which impinge on our strategic culture has been our commitment to democratic values despite various ups and downs. This is also evident from the fact that our armed forces have remained totally apolitical with clear civilian control over the use of armed forces, unlike what has happened in many of our neighboring states or in many parts of the developing world. Armed forces world over are developed to fulfill a nation's strategic policy. While there have been some debates as to whether civilian control has actually become civil service control, our forces have generally operated as envisaged by the Constitution. Let me add that soon after independence, there were some views expressed as to whether we need armed forces at all, more so in view of the policy of non-alignment that we are adopting. But subsequent realities have ensured that we plan and develop of military strength and capabilities to a level befitting a nation of our size and strategic position. It would be worth recalling at this stage what President Kennedy said, and he said, diplomacy and defense are not substitutes for one another. The future strategic culture of India will be largely dependent on how our political hierarchy keeps up with major changes taking place globally. As I observed, globalization getting more entrenched, non-traditional threats are taking over traditional threats and new forms of conflicts will arise. In this regard, it's important to remember that exploitation, 
of sensitivities of our citizens for short term political ends could actually contribute to major domestic upheavals which could in turn be exploited by external powers who are inimical to our interests or our growth we therefore need to have a strategic policy to meet the new threat patterns which could include threats to our economy trade and commerce and could also emerge from aspects like terrorism insurgency and even worse domestic upheavals any policy that we make cannot be in isolation of the international forces at play or the ramification the policy would have on other nations it would be recalled that when we conducted a peaceful nuclear test there were various kinds of sanctions against india in some fields and in fact i think it is the economist of the time magazine which had mrs gandhi initially the cover to say the empress bomb but subsequently a clear enunciation that we would follow a no first use policy belayed apprehensions of many of the nations whether we claim it or not we are a major player in the 21st century economically moving up the chain with a large number of nations looking up to us as a balancing power which has no hegemonic ambitions over the years since independence as also brought out by uh, ambassador srinivasan we have adapted to changing international environment with reasonably positive results even though we may have been a bit slow or extra cautious at times internally we have many issues which we need adept political resolution but have been left as festering issues these have actually restrained us from our socio economic growth and development of nation to our full potential may i repeat that strategic culture of a nation is influenced by its political culture and if that is flawed it would have an impact on the overall strategic capabilities of a nation i'd like to sum up by saying that strategic assumptions the earlier era will need to be modified to meet the new threats threats today are more asymmetric in nature we also need to think and act like a major player in the global scenario and look beyond our immediate neighborhood in this context look at how deftly china has gone beyond looking at issues with india or her other neighbors and has started playing a major role at the global level with a lot of nations more so in the indo pacific region looking to us to provide stability it is incumbent on us to develop our strategic policies accordingly i need hardly emphasize that unless we are in a position of strength our voice would not matter in order to achieve the same we need to develop industrially and economically and also develop our armed forces as a technology intensive and technology savvy units capable of being deployed anywhere in the world our policies also need to adapt to rapid changes that happen across the globe while we cannot choose our neighbors we can certainly choose our friends and built up relationships and closer understanding with like minded nations across the globe wherever they are again i'd like to recall at this stage gladstone who said that in politics there are no permanent friends or enemies but only common interests india by any measure is a significant country capable of emerging as a global power in this century whether we achieve it or not would entirely depend on how quickly we formulate our policies and our way of thinking to meet the needs of a new global order it is incumbent on the young a lot of you sitting here and the policies that you frame and how you can influence our nation thank you jai hind i now invite professor rajesh rajakopalan center for international politics organization and disarmament school of international studies jawaharlal nehru university to deliver the keynote address let me begin by thanking uh, professor gurmeet uh, singh for inviting me to uh, give the keynote address here 
I also want to thank uh, Professor Pillai, who was uh, who's uh, accommodated uh, all kinds of uh, specific demands that I had because of my uh, circumstances. Um, I want to uh, talk uh, uh, broadly from a more academic, uh, from a more IR perspective, from a more academic IR perspective, what strategic culture is and what India's foreign policy challenges are. Uh, the key thing that distinguishes you as, as it were, apprentices in the field is that you have to look at these concepts uh, from a more academic perspective in the sense that you have to look at the definitions of these concepts, you have to look at uh, the evidence for these, uh, for uh, various, uh, for various specific points uh, and you have to look at how these, uh, how these elements hang together. So it is not, it's not, it's not just your opinion, but also how, uh, from an academic perspective, you can sort of uh, make sense uh, of this perspective. Um, so uh, if you look at, I want to begin with what uh, something that uh, the Prime Minister mentioned at the conclusion of the, uh, the Shangri-La dialogue. He said the world is at a crossroads. And uh, what he meant by when he said the world is at a, is at a crossroads, uh, is that countries face a choice between cooperative and conflictual international order and this is you know the fact that he was talking about this was not something new because uh, this is the, the idea of uh, Asia today facing a situation that is very similar to Europe in the pre sec first world war period uh, has been made by other other uh, other uh, leaders also including Prime Minister Abe from uh, Japan who said that uh, 2014 it looks very much like 1914. So in a sense, the, the idea of the world being at a crossroads is something, is something that is not peculiar. But uh, this is something that uh, also uh, one of my uh, other predecessors speak, uh, spoke about, that India has a tendency to frame its dilemmas or its problems as the problems of the world, uh, not as India's problems. And this has rarely worked in the past uh, and it is not going to work this time either. The problems that we face, that India faces, are the problems of India. And the only way that we can resolve it is by ourselves. Nobody else is going to come and help us. There are no free lunches in international politics. International politics is a rather brutal world in which you know you say you serve your self-interest. You don't Indian foreign policy is not for the pursuit of global interest. Indian foreign policy is for the pursuit of Indian interest. And unfortunately, the problem with Indian foreign policy very often has been that we have forgotten what Indian foreign policy is for. Okay. So in a sense, the, the choice that India faces is that we can continue the traditional foreign policy uh, that is barely satisfactory, uh, or we can set a new path in our strategic policy to meet these new, new challenges. Which way would India go? Uh, one way to look at that is from the perspective of strategic culture, and another way to look at that is from the, from the perspective of strategic, uh, structural context. The reason why I put structural context and strategic, uh, strategic uh, culture uh, as distinct is because strategic culture to some, both of them, both uh, strategic culture and structural context in a sense give the same answers, very similar answers at least. So if you look at the current dilemma, for, dilemma that, that we face, both uh, st uh, strategic culture as well as the structural context that India faces has somewhat uh, say the same things more or less. So at one level, Indian foreign policy, as I say, is, is, is paradoxical because we have been very moralistic in our foreign policy. We constantly like preaching to others. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, most foreign diplomats uh, get very irritated with India is because we always preach to everybody else. Uh, but you know, despite the fact that we are preaching all the time, we are also a country that has built nuclear weapons. Right? I mean, so we, peace, we, we preach about peace, but we build nuclear weapons. We are non-aligned, supposedly, but we also aligned, both in 1962 and in 1971, we had a very brief alliance. So it was not as if we were completely non-aligned, right? Uh, we, were, we are supposedly a leader of the third world, but we, had no, we have no great fronts in the, amongst the third world countries. In 1971, the only countries that voted with us at the UN General Assembly uh, against the genocidal East pa Pakistani behavior in Bangladesh, in East Pakistan, where a bunch of East European countries and of course Bhutan, right? None of our third world friends voted with us, right? So because these are not steady friends, these are fair weather friends. So we are also a great supporter of multilateralism. 
but only on multilateralism for others, right? I mean, because we don't support multilateralism when it, come, when it comes to Kashmir, we don't support multilateralism when it comes to nuclear weapons. Uh, it's multilateralism of convenience. So when it's convenient to us, we support multilateralism. When it's not convenient to us, we don't want multilateralism. We are supposedly a democracy, in domestic terms, definitely. But in foreign policy terms, we are a country that is constantly suspicious of democracy. We have never tried to promote democracy. We have never even supported democracy. We are almost always very worried about democracy. We never talk about democracy when the Chinese come or the Russians come or the, when our sundry thugs, friends from various parts of the world come because most of our friends around the world are thugs, right? We, they're not democracies. So whenever they come, we don't talk about democracy because we can't talk about democracy with them. What explains this? Again, what is, the, what, is the, what is the reason why we have these kinds of contradictions? I would suggest again that both strategic culture as well as the structural context that we find ourselves in uh, explain uh, to some extent these, these, uh, uh, these uh, behave, this behavior. Strategic culture is of course a difficult concept. Uh, it's not uh, as academics, as, uh, uh, as students, you would have read something about strategic culture and you know that this is, this, is, uh, this is not an easy concept to grasp. Culture itself is not an easy concept to grasp. Right? I mean, those of you who have studied sociology or anthropology or even political culture know that culture is a very fuzzy concept. It's not an easy concept to understand. We all are intuitively con convinced about the fact that there is something called culture. Right? But it is not very easy to define it. It's not very easy to show it. It is not very easy to... I mean, it's, 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 very, it's, it's very amorphous sort of a concept. concept. It's very difficult to theorize about culture. Uh, what are the sources of this strategic culture? We don't know what, we don't understand, we, you know, it's very difficult to figure out what the sources are. Uh, Ambassador Srinivas have talked about uh, Kautilya, uh, others have talked about uh, Arthasastra or uh, uh, about uh, Ramayana and Mahabharatam and all that. The point is that we have lots and lots of different sources, but it is very difficult to show any one of these things are sources because they're all contradictory. I mean, if you, you can see Ramayana on one hand as an idealist, as a, as, a, as a pain to idealism, you can see Mahabharata as, a, as, a, as reflecting realism, right? I mean, in a sense, you can't, so in a sense, it's very difficult to figure out why we have uh, or what our strategy culture actually tells us because it is not very easy to sort of draw lessons from these kinds of, uh, from these kinds of historical, uh, historical traditions. Uh, so Johnston uh, talks about uh, China's Arrested Ian Johnston, one of his famous works, one of the most famous works on strategic culture. The late, they came out in the late 1990s, and you know it's something that um, some uh, one thing to remember about Arrested Ian Johnston's work is that it was his PhD thesis. So for those of you who have PhD thesis at work, you know there's something to aim for because that's a book that is sort of considered a kind of a defining work on strategic culture. But his work basically argued that China has a has a realist strategic culture. The point, and, and it traces China's strategic culture to the warring, to, to, to the warring states period. Uh, one of the most famous of the warring sta state period military strategies was, of course, Sun Tzu. But there are, Sun Tzu is, who's, the, is the one person who is well known, uh, who came out of that period. But there are other, other military classics, the seven military classics of the Chinese uh, of the warring states period. Uh, but the point about that, uh, the point about it is that he's tracing something 2,500 years back. And the problem is that, the problem that I have with Alistair Ian Johnson's work is that how do we know, how, do, how can we sort of uh, assume that this is where China's behavior today emanates from? What are the links between China's behavior today and the seven military classics of Sun Tzu and so on and so forth? Similarly, India, I mean, you know, we, look, we look at Indian strategy culture, does it come from Kautilya or does it come from Ashoka? I mean, our rhetoric is Ashoka, our behavior is Kautilya. Right? I mean, it is not as if we have a common, uh, a common sort of uh, common uh, template uh, in terms of our, in terms of our, uh, in terms of our, uh, of our, uh, of our behavior. So, in a sense, the question of whether you know does strategy culture change or does it stay the same? I mean, is, does it stay the same for 2,500 years? Is all of our behavior the same? I mean, that makes it difficult sort of to to talk about strategy culture because if you're tracing it all the way back to something 2,000 years back or to myths uh, thousands of years back, then the assumption is that nothing has changed. And that's a very difficult assumption to make. A critical question here is about the independent, whether strategic culture is an independent, ind independent variable or an intervening variable. Because if it's an independent variable, then it has uh, a different, uh, different effect 
than if it is only an intervening variable between something else which is an independent variable and of course the dependent variable. In other words, cause and effect. If it is something that comes in between cause and effect, that is something that is not the same as saying that this is the cause of behavior. That strategy culture is the cause of India's behavior. Right? Assumptions, uh, the assumption is that strategy culture therefore is a subset of larger culture within society, uh, within a society which sort of, uh, which, uh, which influences also our strategy culture. So George Adams' work has been mentioned, been repeatedly talked about. Uh, the man spends a summer in Delhi and decides, thinks he knows what in strategy culture is. And more importantly, uh, he thinks that uh, strategy culture, uh, that India doesn't have a strategy culture. That's not exactly the argument that he made, but the point is that that notion that India doesn't have a strategy culture, which is an absurd notion, because to say that a country doesn't have a strategy culture is, 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 is like saying some, that somebody doesn't have a psychology, because every country has a strategy culture. Just like all of us uh, have some sub sort of psychology, right? I mean, it is, it is only if you are mad, which is basically inconsistent behavior, if you are insane, if you are inconsistent behavior, that you can talk about not having uh, a, a psychology or not having a strategy culture. Right? Strategy culture, uh, to say that a country doesn't have a strategy culture is, an absurd because, is absurd because every country has some sort of a, an underlying basis for its behavior. Um, so, so in the sense that idea that, the, the point is not whether India has a strategy culture. The question is, what is India's strategy culture and how do we sort of, uh, how does Indian foreign policy reflect that strategy culture? Um, so in a sense, one way to ask that question is, was foreign policy, was India's foreign policy inevitable? Again, somebody, I think, um, the admiral asked that question earlier, or I'm forgetting whether Ambassador Srinivasan asked that. Uh, was Indian foreign policy, was India's foreign policy inevitable? If strategy culture is a valid argument, then Indian foreign policy was inevitable. What we have as foreign policy today should have been the foreign policy because nothing would have changed that, right? I mean, it has to, it had to have, it had to have been the same foreign policy irrespective of who was leading the country. So the best evidence is that, the best evidence for that is that we have had all kinds of different regimes, we had all kinds of different leaders, we had all kinds of different personalities, and our foreign policy has remained more or less the same. Right? There has, there is a certain tendency, there is a certain consistency um, uh, across our foreign policy. There is, I mean, I'm sure all of you have read all of these works, but uh, Pradha Bhanu Mehta's ex, uh, essay in India review a few years back uh, about uh, still under Nehru shadows uh, as it is titled. Uh, Paul um, uh, Vipin uh, Narang and Paul Stanley work on India's uh, uh, India's uh, enduring behavior. Uh, Ian Hall's work recently, Priya Chaho, another scholar works are working in Australia. All of them have sort of pointed out, and these are I'm only mentioning the most most recent works. Uh, all of them have pointed to the fact that Indian foreign policy has been very consistent, and the most consistent has of course been, as the most surprising has of course been Narendra Modi, because everybody when he when he came when he when he became prime minister thought, given his rhetoric, given the BJP's language, everybody thought Indian foreign policy was going to dramatically change. And five years down the loan, five years down the line, we know that nothing has changed. Right, Indian foreign policy has remained consistent, and that consistency seems to suggest that there is something uh, that Indian that strategic culture that there is some fundamental strategic culture that is driving India's foreign policy. The other way to look at that, the no would be to say uh, India's foreign policy was driven by Nehru himself personally because of Nehru's dominance in the con within the Congress and the Congress's dominance within the system. Um, but on the other hand, we also have. Uh, the debate between Nehru and Patel about, for example, China, about about Indian foreign policy, and so on and so forth, uh, which suggests that if you know, if, if there was if, if if there was something called strategic culture, uh, and it is consistent, then why would Nehru and Nehru and Patel disagree? Right? I mean, if there was a disagreement between Nehru and Patel, that suggests that India, India did not have uh, there is, that there was no consistent strategic policy or strategic culture. There is also uh, there is also far greater disagreement about Indian foreign policy. Uh, that people are now unearthing because it's only now that scholars are, and actually you, all of you who are working now uh, are uh, in luck to some extent because Indian foreign policy archives are opening up. And so with the opening up of these archives, with, 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 with finding of new archival material, we have more evidence, more, uh, more insight into, into the history of Indian foreign policy. And we know that, for example, uh, in the Constituent Assembly, this is a work by um, Rahul Sagar and Ankit Panda that came out in India Re India Review a couple of years 2015 I think which you can easily find uh, about uh, how in the in the in the constant assembly foreign policy debate there was significant amount of disagreements about the foreign policy section of the uh, of the constitution right 
If there was such a, such disagreement, and Rahul Sagar, who is at the NYU, who is is undertaking a major project that looks at uh, that tries to um, tries to unearth uh, Indian foreign policy thinking and writing going back uh, maybe 50, 60 uh, years before even that, before the First World War, to the middle of the 19th century, right? Because there is a consistent set of writings, I mean, not constant set of writing, meaning that writing not just from Delhi, but also from the Mofisil areas, from, from other parts of the world, of other parts of India. And he's uh, engaged in a major project of trying to unearth all of these, all of these material. And what he's suggesting, I mean, what he's, uh, he has said in, uh, in talks in JNU and other places, is that there is some enormous amount of, uh, enormous amount of uh, diversity in Indian foreign policy thinking, in Indian, Indian thinking about international politics, which again seems to suggest that there is no, if, if strategic culture exists, then you wouldn't expect that diversity, right? I mean, you would expect some, some greater consistent, uh, consistency. So how do you explain all of that? Uh, if, if, there is a, uh, if there is a consistency on the other hand, if it is, yes, if there is consistency in Indian foreign policy, we, we find ourselves in yet another problem, which is whether that consistency comes from culture or whether that consistency comes because our structural position has largely been similar, has largely remained stable. Um, so unchanging structural condition is one reason why one could argue, and I would argue that unchanging structural condition is one reason why we have a consistency in terms of our foreign policy behavior and not because of uh, strategic culture. So uh, one of the reasons for, for if looked at it from that perspective, uh, Indian strategic culture is passive because India is a relatively secure state, and I'll come to that in a minute uh, as to what I mean by saying that India is a relatively secure state. And one could argue that Pakistan's strategic culture is is, in, is aggressive because Pakistan is a relatively more insecure uh, insecure state. Okay, so in a sense, that strategic cultural behavior can be explained by the larger structural condition that uh, that uh, India and Pakistan find themselves in. And I'll explain that in a bit. But uh, but not everything, I would argue that, you know, I, I would accept that not everything can be explained by the, le by, by the structural context because uh, a sense of greatness. Uh, India has been thinking that India was a great power since the time we were, we became independent. Uh, China has always thought of itself as a great power. Brazil has thought of itself as a great power for 200 years. Still not a great power, but still thinks of itself as a great power. Right? Maybe, maybe that's our fate. But the point is that that sense of greatness is maybe something that is beyond structural condition. And maybe that is cultural, in a sense. You know, so that, that is something that, uh, that something that we have to sort of look at. So wh what do we mean by the structure uh, that, uh, what's the structural condition that India finds itself in? The structural condition is that we are the most dominant power in the, in the Indian subcontinent. We are the most dominant power within, within South Asia. Uh, we are a large, uh, secure state that could be indulgent in the sense that, that we could, you know, we could chase whatever will or the wisp dreams that we have in international politics because we are a fairly secure state. India is dominant because India is roughly 70% of South Asia's land, any which way you measure it, uh, India is 70% of South Asia more. And actually after the last, in the last 20 years, that, that gap between India and the rest of South Asia is growing. Right, so India is going to become even bigger and bigger and the, and the relative balance between India and the rest of the region is going to grow. And Pakistan is of course only one part of that. So India's dominance within South Asia is incredible. There is no other country, uh, maybe China today, but uh, no other country which has that kind of an imbalance between itself and the rest of the region. So the consequence of that is that India is a fairly secure state. We don't face any, face any major security threats from within the region. China, I wouldn't consider as within the region. China is outside the region, right? So there is no, because there is no existential threats uh, or even major security threats. So let's assume for the sake of argument that the border, border uh, disagreements with China is a major threat. That is only, uh, you know, even if we lose Arunachal Pradesh, and, I mean, we already lost Aksai Sin. Even if we lose Arunachal Pradesh, it really is not an existential threat. Compare that to how Pakistan feels. Now, I'm not therefore suggesting that Pakistan's existential sense of existential threat is correct, but you have to accept that that is what they feel. Right? Pakistan feels that it will disappear. Uh, it could potentially disappear tomorrow if India uh, manages to attack and incorporate Pakistan within, within, within itself. And that's a possibility because India is so much larger than Pakistan. We face nothing comparable to the kind of threat that Pakistan thinks it faces. Right? So, that, so in a sense, that's what you mean by an existential threat. The fear that we will cease to exist. 
right? And therefore, India does not have that existential threat, and India does not face that kind of uh, even major international threats. So this, in a sense, because we don't face any major threats, when we have a very luxurious security condition, which means that we can we can you know we can chase, we can promote. Uh, non-alignment, moral foreign policy, one one world policies, this that, all sorts of all sorts of things. Because uh, the, re the reason most other countries cannot afford those kinds of things, non-alignment is a luxury that most countries cannot afford. Because most countries require to be aligned with other countries because they face security threats. Pakistan could not be non-aligned for the simple reason that Pakistan faces security threat from India. I mean, irrespective of whether you think it is a, it's a real security threat or not, Pakistan believed that it faces a security threat from India. And most of our neighbors do the same thing. So there's a consistency that you'll find in the behavior of all of our neighbors, all of our smaller neighbors. Not all of our smaller neighbors could balance against India the way Pakistan could, but that doesn't mean that they didn't try periodically. So in a sense, that also explains, you know, our lackadaisical attitude towards, for example, nuclear weapons. And one of the great mysteries, uh, one uh, international relations mystery is that India spent 50 years debating nuclear weapons before it actually went nuclear. Right? We, we, we could have done a, we could have gone for a nuclear weapon in the 1960s. We did not do that. Uh, we tested in the 74, then we decided not to go further with it. We built in the 80s, then we didn't go public with it. Finally, we sort of built it in the, finally we went public with an over nuclear weapon in 1998, right? So there was, you know, there was about 30 years in which we kind of went backward and forward and backward and forward on nuclear weapons. Why? Because to some extent we could afford to do that. Because we didn't face that kind of threat that would require for which nuclear weapons were a response, whereas Pakistan had no hesitation. They ran as fast as they could towards that goal. Israel ran as fast as it could towards that goal. China ran as fast as it could towards that goal. We were the only ones kind of meandering around, you know, trying to look at, look at the flowers and, you know, smell the air and whatnot and we, until we uh, finally we decided, decided to go for a nuclear weapon. I mean, all of that uh, in a sense, is an example of the fact that we could we could afford. We had that time. So uh, the other part of it is that India emphasizes uh, what is called internal balancing rather than external balancing. We don't we don't we don't like alliances. We would rather build on our own our own strength. Right? Again, that's a that's a luxury that very few countries have, and that's a luxury because we are a secure state. Okay. And there have been a couple of challenges to India's regional dominance. Um, you know, which, is, which explains occasional bend towards realism. 62 war was one, 71 was another. And these were the only times, by the way, where we aligned. Right? This was the only times where there was a serious threat against us, where we felt that there was a threat against us. And of course, as soon as there was a threat against us, we, we dumped non-alignment, we became aligned. Right? So in a sense, we, we, we behaved exactly the same way that everybody else would behave. Anybody who faced threat would behave, which is not very different, which is very different from the way that we normally talk about talk about these uh, talk about these uh, conditions but both of these were fairly temporary and what what uh, uh, what uh, Ch even though china was potentially wanted to balance against india china did not have the capacity to balance against india so far uh, and others were not particularly interested why would anybody want to ba why would anybody want to sort of ba balance with sri lanka against india i mean what would they get out of that um, it, it, the, but the next one please but, uh, but China's rise, in a sense, provides us with a new challenge because it's fundamentally different circumstances. There is, first of all, massive material dispar disparity between India and China. Uh, from rough parity in 1990, we are China is now two and a half times our size, depending on how you measure, two and a half to five times, depending on how you measure. Uh, all of this means that uh, there is, in, in addition to military threat, there's also a, or the technological threat. Uh, outside of the United States, China is the only country that has two fifth generation fighter programs, for example. Russia doesn't have one. I mean, the, the only way Russia could build a fifth generation fighter plane was if we funded it. And we did fund it for several hundred million dollars before we pulled the plug on that uh, last year. So in a sense, so there is, the, the, in a sense, the, 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 the disparity between India and China is huge. And for the first time, therefore, we are facing uh, an adversary, we are facing a serious challenge to our, uh, next one please, to our, our uh, strategic dominance within the region. And the challenges that it, uh, that it brings is that uh, it is much more comprehensive and secondly, it will be enduring. I mean, you know, China is not going to go away. Uh, there are constant, we are just discussing the constant uh, predictions of China's demise. But if you are a pragmatic uh, strategist, you wouldn't hope. Hope is not a 
hope is not a basis for strategy and therefore so we have yet assume that China will be an enduring threat. Uh, and China will be much more interested in balancing against India because India is potentially one of the few countries in Asia that can, that can actually balance against China and therefore China will be much more interested in balancing against India. And of course all of our neighbors will use other countries to balance against India. Not because we are bad but because we are strong and they are weak and therefore there will be an automatic temptation for all of these countries to balance against us. That behavior is natural. We should expect that because that's what we have done repeatedly. right? And so it's not, it, what they're doing is not unnatural behavior. What they're doing is a perfectly natural behavior. And secondly, internal balancing is no longer sufficient. As I said, internal balancing was what we preferred. We didn't prefer to ally, ally with other countries. Internal balancing is basically building up your own military, military strength. That is not going to be sufficient because of the relative imbalance between, uh, between India and China. And traditional partners, uh, NAM, Russia, whatnot, are not going to be uh, are not going to be are not going to suffice because obviously they are not they are all much more beholden to China than they are to uh, than they are to India, and so on and so forth. And the most important thing is, of course, finally the Indian state capacity. We are hobbled by political incompetence and political imperatives, which means basically that we are not going to be able to uh, able to sort of uh, manage that uh, on our own. So strategic culture, uh, would strategic culture help deal with these new uh, challenges? I'm, I'm not sure because basically we are still have the same focus on internal balancing. We still think that we are, we are uh, you know, we can balance China on our own. Um, we see partnerships are transactional. Trans I, mean, we, I keep hearing this thing about how, you know, how India doesn't want a transactional relationship. What India means, what New Delhi means when we say we don't want a transactional relationship is that people should give to us but don't expect anything in return. Doesn't happen like that. If people, if people give you something, they expect something in return. That's how international politics works. Every, every international political relationship is transactional. The idea that we should have a non-transactional relationship is simply an excuse for India to say, you know, don't expect anything from us, but give us everything. Right? I mean, that won't, have, that won't work. So foreign policy is still, though, dominated by strategic autonomy and non-alignment, which is also a problem because uh, there is that su continuing suspicion of the United States and West and Australia and whatnot. And so Indian policy is what might be characterized in the literature as hedging, at best. Um, the final uh, set of points is that uh, the, the culture of dominance that India has uh, continues despite the fact that India is no longer as dominant. In a relative sense, we have actually declined over the last 20 years, relative to China. Right? Our position has actually declined, even though, yes, GDP and so on and so forth are growing, but relative to China, we have declined. And we have not understood the implications uh, of what that means, or the fact that we are in relative decline to China. We keep talking about America's relative decline, but the point is that even though America is also in relative decline, India is also in relative decline. And it's the reality that we need to face up to uh, sooner or later. So the notion that India is a great power, uh, you know, uh, the notion that India is equal to China, you are not equal to a country that is five times your size. Right? I mean, that is not equality. And an exaggeration of India's importance, uh, dismissing us towards our neighbors, all of that which we show, saw in Sri Lanka, in Maldives, and so on and so forth, all of these are going to, uh, are, going to uh, are indicators of the fact that elements of that culture continues to, <coughs> continues to uh, hobble our choices. So next one. So which path do we take then? Uh, we have limited choices, uh, but we do have choices. We can appease China, that's one possibility. It has its benefits. I mean, appeasement is a, is a very fine international strategy. It had a good name until Munich, uh, and you all know what happened at Munich. But it was a sort of strategy that was adopted by European countries at different points of time, and other countries at different points of time. Uh, the modern equivalent of Finland is what is called Finlandization, which is what we are facing. So, uh, so appeasing China has its benefits. You can join with a, with a country that is very powerful. Um, and continue to dominate South Asia because for China, India is a bigger, better, better than Sri Lanka or Nepal or even Pakistan. Of course, the, po the problem is that it may be politically difficult to do in within, within India. Uh, domestic political terms, it may be difficult to appease China. And secondly, China may not be interested because China is interested more in a hierarchical order where China, where China is at the top and everybody else has to sort of pay obsession to China. And so that China may not be interested in that. The second choice that we have is whether we can attempt to balance against China. Uh, for that, India needs to align much more vigorously, uh, must be much more uh, open to alliances and uh, things like the Quad. 
Uh, it has to hasten defense reforms, which it, we have we, which we've been talking about forever, and enhance state capacity. And that those are all things that are difficult things to do at the best of times, and of course these are not the best of times. And so a good, but on the other hand, this current condition provides a good test for the structure versus culture argument. If uh, structure is uh, if structure is what leads to behavior, if, if structural conditions are what uh, determines behavior or what at least influences behavior, we should expect a change because structural conditions have changed. If it's cultural, uh, strategic culture that determines Indian behavior, then we should expect no change because culture doesn't change that rapidly. Right? So some early indications are suggest that, uh, you know, Quad, for example, uh, we have the fact that the members of the Quad indicate that maybe our uh, structural conditions are dictating our behavior. We have become much closer to the United States, we have become much closer to American allies in Asia, to Australia, to Japan, Singapore, Vietnam, all of those suggest that we have, uh, suggest that we have uh, structural conditions that are determining our behavior. But on the other hand, we, there is also significant opposition to things like the Quad, to a closer alliance with the United States, uh, to uh, we are the slowest member of the Quad, for example. So that suggests that culture still matters. Right? So, but how this turns out, whether uh, whether we'll change rapidly or whether we don't change, will sort of tell us whether international structural conditions or international or domestic cultural conditions will determine uh, Indian behavior. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you, sir. Next, I'm glad to invite Professor Venkata Rakotam, Dean of School of Social Sciences and International Studies, to give the felicitation address. Respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmeet Singh. Ambassador Srinivasan, Vice Admiral Murli Dharan, Professor Rajesh Rajagopalan, and my colleague uh, Professor Mohanan Pillai. A very good morning to all of, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And first of all, I would like to thank the Department of Politics and International Studies for having invited me. Has a person from the as a historian, I thought that the best way to address would be to take up one issue that on which there is some kind of a strategic culture and a policy option, which is what, uh, which is the keynote or, or the theme of this particular seminar. On the f February 14th, we have had a major calamity, the Pulwama attack. And one of the responses of our political class uh, about, from, about that particular attack was to invoke the 1960 Indus Water Treaty, the Indus Water Treaty that was signed between India and uh, Pakistan in 1960 under the aegis of the World Bank, which negotiated and probably cajoled both these two states uh, to sign that particular treaty. Now, whatever policy that India has, strategic or otherwise, can be framed only within the limits of the 1960 treaty. It cannot go out, out of that treaty because it is now part of the international law. Now, why, why is that treaty so important insofar as India's response to Pakistan is concerned, certain facts need to be kept in mind. One, that India is the upper riparian state and Pakistan is essentially the lower riparian state. And when we look at that, we find that the Indus, that the 1960 Indus Water Treaty distributed the uh, six rivers of the Punjab in a manner that actually favors India. It's a point that very few uh, policy analysts have, um, and, and statesmen, politicians, or even diplomats have really stressed. And how does it do so? The eastern rivers, that is Ravi, Satlej, and Bias, are completely given to India. That is, the complete flow of those three rivers that emanate from China, actually, doesn't even emanate from India flowing down the escarpment of the uh, Himalayas, they come through Tibet into Kashmir and into uh, the Punjab. So these three rivers belong in some sense to India. And the western rivers, Jhelum, Chenab, and the Indus have been assigned to Pakistan. 
and the Indus uh, Water Treaty has another provision that India can draw non-consumptive uh, water from those three rivers that have been assigned to Pakistan as well. So this is the legal situation in which India uh, confronts Pakistan insofar as the distribution of the Indus water is concerned. Now the question is, can India impose a cost on Pakistan consistent with the damage that this asymmetric warfare that is going on in Kashmir entails? We have had some states statements in the recent past that India can invoke this Indus uh, Water Treaty to cut off water supply to Pakistan. The short answer to that question would be that technologically speaking, if we look at the way in which the spillways of the Baligar uh, Dam and the Kishan Ganga project has been designed, it is possible because both of them are not on the rivers that have been given to India, but on the Chenab River, which is actually assigned to, China, uh, to Pakistan. So there is already great technological intervention to divert the course of the river Chenab into the Ravi. It is possibly one of the first interlinking of rivers that will be achieved. So it is already underway. And Pakistan, of course, took the matter to arbitration. The matter went to international arbitration. And in 2005, the international arbiter appointed by the United Nations, gave a verdict which was spectacularly in favor of India. That is, that the diversion and the, uh, the construction of the spillways by which the surplus water of the Shannab can be diverted into uh, the uh, 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 Ravi was accepted and the imprimatur of leg legitimacy to this policy was brought in by the international arbitrator who is supposed to have been a neutral arbitrator appointed by the United Nations. So the second point of this dispute, whether the technological means by which this water can be diverted, a water over which Pakistan claims through the Indus Treaty to have some authority or some ownership has been accepted by the United Nations. And since that time, the, the politics of Kashmir and what we are seeing playing out in Kashmir is not so much the politics of identity. It is more particularly the politics of water. And let us see why it is the politics of water. Now, the, the, uh, the, it is the British who, who uh, drew up the, the plans to make Punjab into an agricultural paradise. This was through the famous Indus Canal construction that was completed in the year 1873. And the Indus Canal uh, headworks are located in a place known as Firozpur, which is just across the border uh, from Pakistan. So the headworks of these canal system is located in India, but 61% of the land that is irrigated by this particular system of canal is located in the Punjab of Pakistan. So, so when Sir uh, Cyril Radcliffe drew up the, the, uh, the boundaries of Pakistan, it should have, well, you know, when we look back in retrospect, either have given the irrigated land to India or made sure that there is some provision for the headway to be shared, headworks to be shared by both. But it so happened that these are territorial decisions, political decisions, and the, when the partition was uh, enacted rather abruptly, the head, uh, headworks of uh, the canal system stayed with India and the irrigated lands. Three very important leaders, Ma Master Tara Singh, uh, Ma, sir, uh, Baldev Singh and Swaran Singh, three very important uh, leaders of the Punjab, wrote to Radcliffe, Sir Radcliffe, saying that this would 
seriously and adversely affect the fortunes of the Punjabi peasant who has actually contributed immensely to enriching the, uh, the, uh, the province of Punjab. Of course, as in most cases, these, uh, these interventions were set aside and the headworks came to India. And in 1948, soon after independence, one of the first acts that independent India did vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan was to shut off the flow of water from the Indus. And it is quite possible that the invasion of Kashmir that happened in the summer of that year was a direct result of this kind of an intervention. It's just possible. I'm not saying that this is the actual thing that triggered off that invasion, but it so happened. So the point is that right from independence, India has ha has having a policy of controlling the access of water, either by strengthening the existing mechanism, for instance, this Balipur, uh, Baligar Dam, as well as the Kishan Ganga project, as well as the more recent uh, developments along uh, uh, in the uh, in the construction of hydroelectric projects in the upper reaches of uh, uh, Kashmir. All of this suggests a pattern that the waters of the Indus belong to India and it is quite likely that international law, if you look at international law, how does Turkey control Euphrates and Tigris by claiming upper riparian rights? How does, um, uh, the, uh, how, how does almost any of the countries that have transnational rivers, it is the upper riparian states that have an advantage insofar as the use and control of water is concerned. And in this particular case in India as well, he's exploiting its geographical position, which is further strengthened by the treaty, the Indus. Uh, what a treaty, as I have said, and more recently by the judgment of the International Court of Arbitration that was set up by the United Nations as a consequence of uh, Pakistan triggering, triggering the mechanism of arbitration. Thank you. Very good evening, friends. I know you have had a very heavy session, and uh, that too after lunch, sitting for that long and listening to very serious academic discussions, they are needed. I am not saying they are not. And political science is a very vibrant subject as I said it in the morning. This is one subject which is constantly changing and you need to update yourself every second day in fact. Uh, I did briefly say what is the thing which is changing. Uh, I will take very little time because a lot of people are waiting and I have to get back. So my friends here, Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan, who you would have been reading He's a very wonderful writer and you read him, his articles in Hindu. Welcome here and very happy to have him. And uh, then Vice Admiral MP Murli Dharan, Professor Rajesh Raj Rajgopalan, my own colleagues, Professor Venkatra Gautam, Monan Pillay and Professor Murthy. Uh, when I was coming here, I asked a number of people from political science background here that uh, what is this AVSM and BAR? And uh, they were a little shocked. And many of them, they did not tell me what is AVSM and bar. Because in Pondicherry, bar has a different connotation. <laughs> and uh, when I said AVSM, uh, that also, you know, a, a young mind replied, uh, Ati valuable strategic material, which is found only in bar. So then I had to tell him it is not Ati valuable strategic material, it is Atibashi Seva medal, and when somebody gets it twice, you write bar. And then I said, what is NM? So he thought for a while, he said, uh, new money, after demonetization. I said, no, it is not. It is, it is no son of medal, naval medal one gets. Only some brilliant, wonderful officers get that. So you should be happy that we have a galaxy of wonderful speakers here and ambassadors and uh, these are the minds when they sit together and strategize the strategic culture then the real paper emerges out of it somebody had asked me what is the purpose of these uh, seminars i said it is these very seminars which will bring out 
a real spark and ultimately the paper which is documented here and sent, somebody picks up the lead out of it and then a real policy is given. I am glad that this is being organized by our political science department here uh, on a very important uh, topic, Indian strategy, culture and policy options. As I said, this subject is a very vibrant subject. Whatever you had in good old days uh, about that Western and Eastern Bloc, that is gone. Importance of uh, Middle East is gone. The trade routes have changed. Here also, you have uh, Indian Ocean becoming a very important trade route. Southeast Asian region is becoming important. ASEAN is becoming very important. And above all, within your own country, the poles are around the corner, and all our young minds have to play a very important role. You will find those two political groups who would never see one another are uh, hugging one another now. And how things are going to change, this is also going to be a very good exercise for all of you to work on. So therefore, this is the domain of political science and international relations to work on. That's why it's a very interesting subject. And you in particular, I'm talking about the young minds, you in particular have to interact with our brilliant minds here during lunches and uh, dinners and evening teas. This is why I keep telling them, don't let them relax and enjoy their teas. Interact with them, discuss all your problems, sort it out, and then this will give you a direction about what area to do research on, which is going to be the most interesting one. So therefore, work on this and make the best use of this. I compliment uh, our department for organize, organizing a good, uh, wonderful seminar. I hope it will be very fruitful to all of you. Uh, from the numbers, it seems that this is already generated a lot of discussion in the minds of people here. I am sure it will bring in the required fruitful results. I wish the seminar a grand success and all the very best. Thank you so very much. So I am very much happy to see all the students here. Uh, I am supposed to deliver my word of thanks address very strategically. So the time is so uh, you know, running out. I, I think we have got 50 uh, purpose written by various scholars that all will explain how you are going to define strategic culture and strategic options that you are supposed to choose from the strategic culture existing in this country. More often strategic culture is looked from the point of view of military, foreign policy and security. There are some other dimensions that we should think that is something to do with peace and human development. Strategic culture is, really speaking, it is much concerned about peace and development. It's the center of all. Therefore, we should see different dimensions accordingly. We have to have brainstorming sessions in the coming two days. I thank all the participants. I thank all the dignitaries. I thank all my ambassadors and academicians like Raja Raja Gopalan, my junior was in a vibrant uh, kind of situations when I was in the 80s doing my PhD in JNU. Uh, still he is so vibrant. I really thank for the great keynote that he has delivered. We have to give him a very big clap that he has given. I am also very thankful to the Admiral. I have been listening to him for the last say more than 10-15 years. He is so uh, dynamic. He has delivered a beautiful address. And that will definitely provoke you guys to have more uh, questions in the coming days. I am very thankful to sir for the great address that you have delivered. I am also very thankful to our friend, long-term friend, Ambassador Srinivasan, who has been coming to this university uh, quite often. I has been delivering for the benefit of the youngsters. He is a person who will see the prog pragmatism of any kind of concepts. You all know concept as wise, we are not uh, very much uh, definable. We are not defining any concept as well. Therefore, conflicts exist always. Conflict exists because of the ambiguous uh, kind of status that we always throw on any concepts. And that, uh, that's the reasons why uh, Srinivasans are like people always go for defining concepts from different dimension and perspectives. I am really thankful to for the great delivery that delivered by our Sri Vasanthar. Also, I thank uh, my Vice Chancellor who has strayed for quite a long time. You know, he has a busy schedule and he agreed to stay uh, listening to all the people. I really 
uh, have no words to thank him because he has been inspiring force in this campus for the quite long time now, one year now, completed successful completions. And we are also waiting to see him uh, in different times in the next academic years. And he has got lots of plans for our youngsters. And he has also given certain policy decisions that the youngsters should be encouraged uh, for participating in decision making process. You all know strategies are very close concepts for three important uh, policy, plan, and executions. This all three stages very much winnable means we are strategically well placed. So we are supposed to understand strategy from the fun functional point of view. Functionalism is very important. If you are winner, you are strategically very strong. So it's a win-win situation that you have to create. For that only the strategy works. So my dear friends, economic strategy, political strategy, cultural strategy, so many strategic dimensions that you are coming across as academicians. But more often our soldiers standing in the borders, uh, we should all understand that the sacrifice that they have been doing without any kind of return. So such strategic options also we have to address. I'm very thankful to all the participants. Think about your own personal strategy for the country, for the nation building. How to go about building our nations, how to go about building our uh, knowledge society. Accordingly, we have to build a sustainable strategy order that will help the younger generations in the years to come. Thank you very much for this great Thank you.